so misses the class. So the plan is very simple. Uh, we want to talk today about the course, the format of the course, uh, what to expect, how it will go, how it will work. And uh, there are a few questions that I have for you regarding the class format. So there are a few options that I'm sort of indifferent about. I'm fine either way. So I want to get some input from you uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, that the choice we, uh, the option we choose is the one that is best for you. And so we'll talk about the course format, about the course uh, content, um, as well as I will talk a little bit about the um, uh, sort of expectations from my side to you, but also if you have any requests, it will be your opportunity to um, uh, share your sort of um, preferences and um, uh, maybe experiences. And so um, I would like to start this course with a little sort of activity. And if we were in the same classroom, I would actually play it, you know, for real. But this time I'll just tell you how it goes. But it's a very important one because it sort of illustrates the challenges of teaching international business. So usually before I even introduce myself, I would um, uh, ask my students to point in the direction of north. So everybody sit in the classroom. In fact, you can try to do it now if you want. So think about where you are in this sort of world and think about which way is north and point with your finger to, to north. And so, yeah, just like what you're doing now um, uh, on your screens, that's exactly what happens in the classroom. And so if I have enough people, if I have like 40 people like what we have in this course or so, there would be always people pointing in every possible direction. And so at that point, I would say, hey, for example, Adidas and uh, Midla, Milda, for example, did you notice that you're pointing in different directions? You seem to be about the same age. You seem to be of equal education level, intellect. So you realize that at least one of you is definitely wrong. And you kind of look at each other and smile. And, you know, and then I say, well, let's play this game again. But this time, only participate only if you are absolutely sure that you know which way north is and just don't participate if you're not sure. At that point, out of like 40 students, probably 10, 15 would drop out, but another, the remaining 25 or so are still playing the game and are still pointing in every possible direction. Then I would literally choose two people and say, well, gentlemen or ladies and gentlemen, would you like to participate in this game? Because it seems like at least one of you is wrong. And people still insist, no, no, I know, and he's wrong or she's wrong, and I definitely am right. And so at that point, obviously, I would take out the compass and I would say, well, you know, north is in that direction, but it's not the point of this exercise. The point of this exercise is that people tend to stick to their opinion and believe that they are right and somebody else is wrong, even when it's clear that, you know, statistically impossible or mathematically impossible that all of them would be right. Like even if the evidence that you see around you indicates that you're probably wrong. And so the reason I play this game is uh, at the beginning of this course is the following. Teaching international business is very difficult because it's one of those topics, one of those subjects where people have um, sort of very strong but often uneducated opinions about. Um, let me explain it this way. Uh, my first course that I taught in my sort of career, it was at the University of Texas at Dallas uh, in the early 2000s was statistics. Teaching statistics was very easy. Uh, students tend to be terrified of statistics. Students know they don't know statistics. And so they would never question if you tell them, you know, this is how this formula works. They don't disagree. They just say, okay, well, good to know. Or maybe they have difficulties understanding it. Teaching international business is the opposite. Students believe that they know all of the answers already. Uh, they have seen uh, political debates, they have seen political advertisement, uh, they have talked about, you know, politics. And so they think, well, what's here to learn? I mean, the topics of this course are things like, for example, immigration. Well, I know everything there is to know about immigration. I mean, of course, I've been following the whole, you know, developments. Or, for example, regional integration, you know, the European Union, Brexit, the wall between the United States and Mexico. I mean, you're going to teach me about regional integration. I know everything there is to know. I know that the British are, or Boris Johnson is, and then depending on your political affiliation, either very smart or very stupid. I know that uh, the European Union, and then again, depending on your political affiliation, is very good or very bad. So I don't need to take a lecture on that. I already know the answer. Um, currency exchange rates. Oh, I've traveled a lot. I know that there are different currencies. I know that I can exchange my euros for dollars or for you know whatever the currency it is. 
And so that makes it very difficult to teach a course like this because just about any topic that we will be discussing, you probably will have disagreements with one another and possibly with me. And so that makes it very difficult for two reasons. One, as I said, when we go through the topic, many of you will have sort of you know, emotional responses because these are not neutral issues. As I said, if you catch 10 people on the street and ask them about, for example, accounting or finance, most of them will not know what you're asking and they will say, oh, I don't know. But catch 10 people on the street and ask them about immigration or currency exchange rates or the Eurozone or the European Union. And nine out of 10, maybe even 10 out of 10 will not only tell them that they know better than you, they will actually try to convince you that you're wrong. And so that makes it very difficult to teach international business because it's such an emotional list of topics where people think that they know the answer, even though they never really read any specialized literature on the topic. Second problem is that when it comes to the exams, again, in statistics, when I taught statistics, students were happy to get a B. In many cases, they would show up for the exam when they don't even recognize the topics. In international business, it's a little bit different. You all come to the exam thinking that you already know all of the answers. And so when you get a B or eight out of 10, you think, oh, what's wrong? I thought I knew everything. How come I didn't get a you know, perfect 10 or perfect 100? And so uh, again, the point here is that there is a little bit more to, for example, exchange rates or regional integration or international trade than a normal person sort of knows without any special training. And so just like with this compass activity, sometimes you will find yourself in a situation where you will think that you know the answer, kind of keep your mind open, keep the possibility open that you may be not necessarily wrong, but perhaps not know enough quite yet. And so hopefully after this course is over, you will be able to say, now I actually know more about international business. So now let me talk a little bit about myself and then I wanna have a, a few questions for you guys and then um, uh, we'll talk about uh, the course itself. Uh, so I got my PhD in Canada, University of Calgary. I specialize in international business in general, but my specialty is uh, cross-cultural teams. So when you have uh, a bunch of people from different countries and they have to work together, all kinds of things can go wrong. Uh, but then also there are all kinds of uh, opportunities for them to do well. And so my job is to uh, research, but also as a consultant to teach companies how to sort of minimize the problems and maximize the advantages of international sort of differences. Uh, my prior education was in economics. Uh, so University of Texas, Dallas, it was pure economics. And originally I'm actually from Ukraine. So before that, I'll, I'll talk about the geography in, in a minute. So it's been like half a dozen countries before I ended up here. So um, professional affiliations, Academy of Management, Academy of International Business, you know, the usual things, uh, editor of a couple of international business journals, uh, editorial board member of a few more. And um, so here is a little bit about my geography. So I was born in Ukraine. I left Ukraine uh, at the age of 16 in 93 uh, to study in Germany as a high school student. And then since then, it's been one country after another, mainly for education. Mm -hmm. The closest I got to your country, I spent some time in Norway, in Stavanger, so which is um, not quite Lithuania, but close enough. Uh, it was in 1999, probably, or something like that. So uh, then I did my um, uh, one degree in Texas, uh, then in Canada, and now it's been about 12 years in North Carolina. Uh, actually, North Carolina is now the most permanent location, uh, or I've never lived for so long in one city. Uh, before coming here, I did the math. I think I changed the address as something like 16 times. And so here that these pins represent places where I lived long enough to have a mailing address. So it's not necessarily for years, but it was long enough where I was receiving mail to that address. So in most of the cases, it was e either for work or for study uh, or for teaching, uh, you know, things like that. And so all this international travel sort of prompted uh, my interest in international business. So as I said, my um, uh, first two degrees were in economics, but then I kind of switched from uh, numbers and from economics kind of as, as classic economics to more interpersonal relationships. It just at some point it became sort of uh, obvious to me that uh, the human side of business may be more interesting and more important than just simply the resources, you know, the money that you have or the resources you have. Just like with, you know, smartphones, you can have the biggest uh, RAM, the fastest memory and chip, but if the software is not working, this would be just a piece of metal and glass. Same thing with organizations. You can have the best ideas, the, the, the biggest, you know, the most patents, 
the uh, biggest resources, but if your people are not working correctly, uh, it, it's a problem. Um, and so um, I kind of switched from my doctoral studies more into this human side of business, particularly international business uh, sort of, or human interactions in the international business context. And so that's what I've been primarily studying lately, even though I do have a pretty strong background in classic economics as well. Uh, this is my family. It's a couple of years ago. It's uh, the last conference we attended before pandemic. So I have two kids and uh, uh, a wife. And uh, so just to give you some kind of background, they're a little bit bigger now. So I cannot believe it. It's been only a couple of years, but they're like twice the size now. So I probably should have updated the picture. They've been growing quite fast lately. And um, oh, and uh, yeah, so my name, I didn't really start with my name. So my Ukrainian name obviously is Vasil. Uh, I usually go by Vas, and my last name is Taras Taras. And so those of you who know something about the sort of the, the, the Eastern European history, so my last name is a very common first name. And so it just happened to be the case. So it just last name sounds like first name. So, but I usually go by Vas uh, among the friends. And then actually many people call me by my last name, including my wife for some reason. So I guess it's not a very big Sorry, name. excuse me. Yeah, Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, with so many places you lived in, uh, how, how, how does the family feel with so much travel? Um, it's a very, very, very good question. And in fact, in one of the lectures, I addressed it a little bit more. But um, yes, it's difficult. And um, up until pandemic, when people said, oh, I want to go and travel somewhere or I want to relocate, I was only smiling because, you know, if you relocate very often, it actually becomes very difficult. And so at some point, plus because of work, I have to travel a lot, at least like three, four times international trips a year, it sort of becomes a little tiring. And then it also at some point, you know, you've seen enough that it's not like if you go to a really, really new location, I guess it's, it's nice. But if you go yet again to like Germany or yet again to Japan, it's not really that much exciting. It is very challenging. And the reason for that is, um, if I can explain it correctly, uh, once you start changing places, you get this almost like a virus or syndrome of being dissatisfied with wherever you are. Uh, like, for example, when I was still in Ukraine, I thought Ukraine had the best climate, uh, you know, four seasons, beautiful, nice. But then you visit a few other places. And at some point, I cannot be fully satisfied with the climate because I've been to places where it's, you know, warmer, colder, more beautiful in the spring. Like for example, now in North Carolina, the temperature fell a little bit down. And so I think, well, in Canada, at least I would be going skiing. Here it just cold. Second biggest problem is obviously friends. Uh, so you develop some friendships and then you, you lose them. And then again and again, and with family, the same thing with kids. And so no matter where you go, something's missing. So you always think, oh, you know, I wish my Canadian friends were here or I wish my, you know, Texan friends were here. And so the only way to make me fully happy now at this time or anyone who moves is to maybe if all of those places became sort of one country and all of the friends came to the same place and then the climate was made perfect so that you have sort of a mountains and ocean and lakes and you know it's not too hot and not too cold and so you sort of kind of set yourself up for always missing something and so uh so it is fun but at the same time it's not easy and so I'm kind of happy that I haven't been moving much lately. So because finally you have a little, you know, stability and a little, you know, like kind of social network around you. So, but at the same time, I highly recommend, I know many of you are from different countries. And so most of you, I assume are 20 something. So before you move, you know, turn 30, do travel and move as much as you can, because it will be first much harder to do it after you are, you know, with the family and kids. And second, uh, it actually does, you know, it does come at a cost, but at the same time teaches you a lot as well. So you, you, you know, sort of, you cannot learn some things from books. And so when you, when you live in different places, you definitely get that exposure. So I definitely recommend, uh, you know, maybe taking some courses overseas, maybe taking your first job in a different country, maybe, I don't know, just going and, you know, seeing the country. So definitely a good idea. So, but yeah, but you will then be forever and ever not fully content. So there will be always something missing. You will be always thinking, oh, in Canada, they had such beautiful mountains. Or in Texas, they didn't pay uh, uh, state income tax, and here we are paying taxes. Or, you know, Germany, oh, it was, you know, those nice European cities with the red roofs and, you know, cafes on the street. So I guess, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about you guys. I have a few questions for you, and let me see if I can do the polls. I just want to get a sense of who we are 
who you are. So my first question is, I want to get a sense of what kind of uh, major or area of study um, you represent. So if you can tell me what's your sort of background and other, I assume maybe some of you come from non-business disciplines. And if that's the case, uh, let me know. But it seems like we have quite a few people who are specializing in international business. I see a few economics, entrepreneurship, management, very good. Uh, so those two people who are other, what kind of majors are you? Can you tell me? So hello, can you hear me? Yes, Samuel, yeah. Uh, hello, I study law in my hometown uh, and I also choose this course because I was um, at a business school at my high school and I'm also interested in uh, business, so that's why. Yeah, by the way, many business schools have joined degrees with law schools. Like for example, our MBA students can at the same time get a law degree and apparently there is a huge demand for sort of business law or or businessmen who know the law or lawyers who know business. And so you- Yeah, sure. Uh, my friend, uh, he's studying in uh, English in England and uh, he attends school, which is uh, half business and half uh, law. And after a few years, uh, he could decide which way he would uh, do his master degree. Well, it's not even which way, you can do both at the same time. Like there is a huge demand for people who know both. And so there are jobs like literally you can be practicing corporate law or business law or be in business as a person with the legal background. So you will be in huge demand. So yeah. uh, definitely good. And who is the other one, other? There is another student who chose other. That's me, can you hear me? Yep, yep, I can hear you. Go ahead. Um, um, like my major is philology and I'm an Erasmus student and in my university in France, I study philology, international business and international relations. Uh -huh. That's why I have some business classes. Uh -huh, yeah, and that's actually interesting. So some of the first international business scholars were from philology. So they were linguists, and they kind of studied languages or, or cultures, and then sort of started exploring the kind of the, the international aspect of business. And now it's obviously a separate discipline, but yeah. So, but anyway, this is the, the result, if you can see it. So we have a good mix here. So we have pretty much students from every, every area. So that's very good. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask, let me see how I go back to the polls and, um, how do I start the next one? Uh, how do I go to the next one? Uh, stop sharing result, results. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to see also what kind of career you guys aspire. So uh, what kind of job you wanna have uh, when you graduate or after you graduate. So um, let's see what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. And that's very similar to what I see in my own classes. So most people are sort of aiming at a job at an existing company, kind of salary based. Some want to start their own business. Oh, we have somebody who wants to be a professor, a scientist. Who is that? Let's select my favorite student. Anyone? Who, who's that brave uh, person it's who wants me. to become an academic? Uh, Margarita? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. very good, very good. Thank <laughs> well, you. As long as you select the right major, so as long as you go into business, law, or medicine you can actually have a pretty comfortable life as a professor. So the salaries for some reason are very different depending on discipline. Like if you wanted to be, for example, I don't know, like a historian or, or, or maybe like, I don't know, literature professor. Yeah, not a very good idea. So for some reason, they're not very well paid and um, you know, you will struggle. But if you end up as a business professor, as a law professor or medicine professor, one, you will actually have a very comfortable living Second, you will always be able to make some money on the side as a consultant and uh, you will have a little bit more freedom because you know uh, you don't have a boss unlike all those people who chose a corporate job. They will have a boss who will yell at them and you know who will uh, make their life sometimes not very pleasant. Uh, so academics don't have bosses. I mean, we kind of have deans, but I, I see my dean maybe twice a year, so that's it. So you have a little bit more freedom. You can choose what you want to study. Uh, so, but then again, yes, those people who chose to start my own company, so they have a chance to become really, really rich, like filthy rich. So academics usually are comfortable, but not very rich. So um, yeah, but good choice. All right. Okay. So uh, let me show you the results. It seems like most of you want a corporate job. And then many of you, many of you want to start a business. Very good. And then at least we have one person who wants to become a scientist. Uh, so, and, and save the world. Very good. All right. And so let's see if I can um, uh, stop sharing results. And there is one more question that I wanted to ask this one. And I wish I could make it anonymous, but I can assure you that your answers will not affect my assessment or, or 
uh, opinion about you. I just want to know for myself. So why are you taking this course? For example, when I taught statistics, people always said, because it's a required course. I don't care about statistics, but I have to take it. I would prefer not to take it, but I have to take it. So let's see what we have here. So it seems like most people have to take it and so otherwise they wouldn't take it, but uh, you know, they took well, it. Well, that's, that's the problem because the way you represent it, um, for some of us, maybe it would be really interesting course. And um, there is like, a, you can pick it because it's required. And I had to take it with a, a negative smile, but maybe we're happy that we have to take it. Well, my goal is that by the end of this course, you will say, man, am I happy that I took this course? But uh, yeah, fair enough. And unfortunately, it's exactly the same thing, uh, thing with my students. It's a required yeah. course and uh, a good half, if not more, say, well, normally I wouldn't take it. Normally I would take something else, but I had to take it. So here I am. But uh, as I said, my hope is that by the end of the subject, many of you will say, you know what? It was such a good course. Maybe I should change my major. Maybe I don't want to do accounting anymore. I want to be an international business specialist. So we'll see how many of you will be, uh, will be able to convert. And so we have two people who chose others. So uh, what's the reason? What's other reasons? Uh, I'm, I'm curious because normally I don't see other much here. Anyone? So those two people who chose other, what are your reasons for being here? I'm an Erasmus student too. And uh, I have uh, found the recommendation from another student at my university. And they say that uh, like it would... It can be a great course for me and it was no doubt I have chosen this like immediately. Okay, okay, well fair enough. So good to know. Well, I'm very happy to see as you can see now, oh, share results. Uh, so that the majority or at least the most popular answer is I love IB and I wanted to take international business and I wouldn't miss the opportunity. Uh, followed closely by uh, it's a required course, I wouldn't take it, but I had to take it. So, okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, well, also interesting that none of you think that it will be an easy course because some people say, well, like statistics or accounting, those are hard. So I'll take international business and we'll just talk about things. So this one will not be that easy. So uh, I'm glad that most of you do not expect an easy sort of ride. All right. And let's do one more. I just want to know the geography. So uh, where are you from? So um, what countries do we have represented in the course? So just curious, I know we have some Erasmus students, uh, very good, so, uh, but I'm, I'm curious to see if we have many non-European students, for example. So we have Asia, we have other, other that would be what, like Polynesia or island groups, or did I miss one of the continents? So the, 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 the person who chose other, uh, what's, what's the, the region or country? Well, it's Turkey, I mean, it's- Ah, uh, yeah, it's kind of in between, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like literally in between. So you would be sitting there on that, you know, uh, Bosphorus Strait and you literally see Asia and Europe at the same time. So, yeah. yeah. I confidently chose Middle East instead. So was, that, just, was that you, John? I said I confidently chose Middle East instead, so she could do that too. Yeah, but yeah, with Turkey, it's tricky. So that's, you know, it is sort of right in the middle, like geographically you literally can be sitting in a cafe looking at that you know body of water and you know that this side is europe and this side is asia geographically speaking and so uh and yeah so you cannot really you know uh, yeah i i can see why it sometimes doesn't fit, fit neatly into one of the categories and so we have middle east we have asia <clears throat> we have uh, most of the students from europe so and then who is the other one who chose other <clears throat> Sorry, one student chose, uh, so Turkey couldn't place it, and then I see there is another one. Is that the same situation or another country? Oh, I, it's, no, again, me, yeah, but uh, my city belongs to Europe, like geographically, but uh, I'm from Russia, from St. Petersburg. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah, that, well, that one, I suppose that's, that's Europe as it gets, right? Because, you know, at least officially until you get to the Ural Uralis Mountains, uh, it, it's still Europe officially. But yeah, the country itself spans obviously, you know, uh, two officially continents. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to see that we have many different countries in the class. Uh, so that allows us when we will be talking about international business. I hope in some cases, some of you will say, oh, yeah, yeah, in my country, it's like this. Or no, no, in my country, it's different. So that way we will be able to sort of validate some of the statements that we'll be making as we move along. 
All right, let me talk a little bit about the course. Um, so we've gone through these questions here. Um, uh, so what's this course about, or how easy it is to get in this course an A plus or 10, I guess, on your system. So this course is not like this. So some courses you kind of have to, you know, wander around and, you know, figure out what the professor wants. No, uh, this course is not complicated. It's very straightforward. So this course is more like this. But this is both good news and bad news. On the one hand, the good news is that your road to a perfect grade is straight. The bad news is that the road to the perfect grade is straight and you cannot take a shortcut. So um, the content of this course uh, will require that you do a lot of readings and that you process a lot of material. And so you can be very smart, uh, you can be very creative, maybe you can even have a lot of business experience and uh, international experience. But unless you walk the walk, you will not get a high grade in this course. Because if you haven't done the readings, chances are you will not be able to sort of guess the answers on the exam. So in some subjects, in some courses, you know, as long as you're very smart, you kind of can figure that out. Here, if you do the readings, if you watch the lectures, you will know the answer. It's, it's nothing difficult. Once you've heard it once, you will know the answer. But if you have not read it, chances are you will not know the answer. So it will require a considerable amount of time. And so if, if you invest that time, it's, it's very simple. You just basically do the weekly lecture and you're ready for the exam. But if you don't do the weekly lecture, if you don't do the readings, chances are you will not be able to guess the, the answers on the exam. And so if I may, I'll give you this illustration. Again, in a real class, I actually have a real cup that I use for the illustration, but here I'll use the sort of the visual graphics. So if I ask you if this glass is full or empty, what would you tell me? What would you say? Is it full or empty? It's empty. Empty, all right. There is always someone smarty pants who says, well, technically it's full because there is air in it. But yes, I agree, it is empty. How about now? Is it full or empty? It's overfilled. <laughs> overfilled. So some people say that it's full, but then some people will say, well, it's kind of full, but there is all that space between those uh, rocks. So if I add all these little pebbles, uh, is it full now? Oh, if you think like full, full, then no, <laughs> because you can just put like pour some, uh, you know, sand in there. Or like or beer, like for example. Water. <laughs> yeah. Or be yeah, yeah, beer can also work. Yeah. <laughs> well, so here is what I'm trying to say here is that this course is uh, sort of has multiple components. So these big rocks, they are basic knowledge about international business that everybody has. And so that's, for example, knowing that there are different countries in the world and that there are different languages in the world and that there are different currencies in the world, you know, and that there are different, you know, like political or economic unions or blocks like the European Union. So this is something you must know, but it will not be enough uh, to get a good grade in this course. In fact, you will not get even, you know, two with just basic knowledge. These little pebbles, that's what the focus of this course is. So that's where we will be looking at some specialized knowledge. And that's uh, where, you know, basically what we will learn, but that's also what the exams will be about. So the exam questions will not ask you, for example, you know, how do you convert uh, euros into dollars? The question will be, for example, what affects the exchange rates? So you'll need to know the specific, let's say, seven, eight factors that can exchange affect what the exchange rates are. And so this is what the focus of this course will be. So th these big things we sort of, um, you know, assume that you already know, and the focus will be on this stuff that uh, sort of is related, but most people don't know. And so, yeah, that beer, that's for the graduate school. So if you decided to major, you know, like do your doctorate or master's degree in international business, so that that's where you will fill all those little gaps. And you'll probably need a lot of beer, you know, to survive because it sometimes gets very, very difficult. But yeah, that's something we will not be touching. So we will look at this kind of stuff that is beyond the common knowledge, but perhaps we will not go into all the depth that you would do if you were to become basically a doctoral student in international business. Now let's talk about um, the outline for the course, so the syllabus. And so you got the copy of the syllabus. And uh, so I'll open it here. And so we'll take a look together, just, you know, the most important things. My contacts, uh, if you have a question, don't hesitate. If it's something quick, you can even call me if you want uh, or send me an email. Um, I'll try to be online every Friday, this time your time. So that's the best time, but just about any time should be fine as well. Uh, email works best um, and usually I will respond quickly, but because of the time zone differences, it may be the next day 
for you. Uh, textbook, uh, we don't need one, but if you want, uh, you can get uh, International Business by Wild and Wild. I highly recommend it. Uh, that's the one that I use in my course and you can use it uh, you know, to catch up on, on readings. Uh, I checked, you have a couple of copies of that book in your library and um, you can also buy an older version. So the latest one is eighth edition and it's pretty expensive in the United States. It's something like $170. But if you go to, a uh, to a, an older edition, they're nearly free. So you can literally get like fourth or fifth, edi fifth edition for like $5 on eBay or whatever system, uh, whatever marketplace you use in, in Lithuania. And so they're not very different. So once you have passed fourth edition, they update the statistics, they give you more recent examples, but the content is basically the same. So therefore an older edition is also perfectly fine. There is also a very similar book available again for your uh, library, um, free uh, electronic. Uh, so you can use this one. It covers almost all of the same concepts. So something that you might wanna use. Although I will say that um, the lectures should be enough and the slides that I created for the lectures, I deliberately made them very sort of wordy. As you will see, my slides are, um, they, they look almost like notes. So it's not just bullet list, I actually have full sentences. And that's intentional. So the goal here is that you can make that uh, sort of my slides almost like, almost like a summary of the book that you need to read. And so if you will not get the book, it's not a huge problem. You will probably do just fine. And there are other um, uh, international business textbooks available at your library. I checked, I even give you here the numbers. Again, they're pretty similar. So most of the international business textbooks cover basically the same list of topics. And so you will be able to find 80% of the sort of chapters or topics in these books, even if it's a slightly different book than the one that I recommend. In, ter in terms of the course objectives, um, it's not so much a how-to course, it's more uh, of what is course. So um, in some courses that I teach, uh, the focus is more on teaching you how to do things. Here, it's more about how the world works. So we will talk about how sort of international business is set up. And so there will be a little bit more of this explanation of how the world operates. And so what you need to know and the terminology and the principles as opposed to how do you start your own business, for example. Although many things will eventually be, or at the end of each lecture, we will talk a little bit about, you know, sort of how you can apply this knowledge to be more successful in business. And you can read the whole thing here when you have time. So these are the topics that we will cover from globalization to economic systems, political systems, but then also the role of government in international trade, international trade itself, uh, foreign direct investment. And then the second half of the course will kind of go through each functional area of business, but with the international component, like international marketing. So what I will tell you is that you probably took an international marketing course. You probably know some of the basics of, internet, uh, of marketing. You probably know like what market segmentation is, what are the possible advertisement channels are. But then in my lecture, I will say, now let's consider why it may not work in international context why, for example, the principles of kind of basic domestic marketing may not work in a different country. Why, for example, the um, advertisement strategy that works well in Vilnius may not work in Tokyo or in New York. And so same thing with international management, international operations, and so on and so on. And so we kind of start big. So we start with, you know, country level, then we get to the firm level, and then all the way to people level, sort of to um, interpersonal relationships. Uh, course format, it's an online course. Um, so if it were not for the pandemic, maybe we would do it face to face, but uh, here it's an online course. And so it will be basically a series of video lectures. For most of the lectures, I also provide an audio version. Um, and uh, so this way, if you, for example, wanna listen to the, video, uh, to the lecture when you, I don't know, work out in the gym or when you are running or when you're cleaning your house or whatever you do, uh, you can do that. So. Sometimes it's kind of useful to see the you know, picture, maybe some graphs, but I try to explain them enough. So if you only listen, you, sh you should still be able to get, you know, to understand what I'm talking about. Now with the lectures, uh, the, it's, I think it's my seventh time that I teach this course uh, for the Vilnius University students. And uh, we tried uh, the first few times we tried live lectures and it was not a very good idea for several reasons. 
One, uh, sometimes technology didn't work. Sometimes the connection is not good. And even if my connection is perfect, maybe your connection is not. Maybe where you are, I don't know, the internet is not fast enough or, or something else goes wrong. Second, um, not all students are able to attend the lecture. So if I see correctly here, we have about 37 students in the class now, but I think we have 47 total enrolled. So it's about 10 who couldn't make it. And so sometimes objectively, you may not be able to make it to the lecture. Maybe you're, I don't know, sick or busy or who knows what can happen. And so I figured why force you to be here live when you can watch it when you have time. And then when it's a recorded lecture, uh, it has a few advantages. One, the sound is more clear. Uh, the picture is higher resolution. But then also importantly, you can uh, pause, you can rewind some things, you can listen maybe to some things twice, maybe you can skip some things. And so I don't mind, you know, whatever works for you. So as long as, as, long as you kind of master the subject, I don't really care when you take it. And so I figured, you know, a long lecture, sometimes one and a half hours, uh, can be quite boring. So if you take pauses, why not? So I figured pre-recorded lectures would be much more effective than live lectures. So you have the links, uh, you can watch them whenever you want, but we will have regular live meetings like the one today. And so uh, you will still have opportunities to ask questions. We will have a live uh, session before each exam. We will have a live session uh, explaining to you how the X culture project works. Um, uh, one of the components of the course, we will have the final lecture. So we'll have enough face-to-face -face contact, but the actual lectures, it seems like it works better when you just have pre-recorded. And then you have slides, as I said, uh, that are made de deliberately sort of with a lot of text so that you can read them almost like a book, as opposed to just see simply see the pictures and bullet lists. Uh, the exam, uh, I mean, the course grades. Excuse me, uh, yes, just ahead, a please. question. Yeah. Uh, with the uh, pre-recorded lectures, I had a question I just forgot. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'll, I'll remember it like in a few seconds. But yes, uh, lectures are pre-recorded and uh, so live sessions are not required, but recommended. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll remember so the question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, is it like, would the lectures be all, you know, uploaded now? So we can just like watch all in one go, or is it just like will be there uh, uploaded like over the time, like uh, one like for example one lecture is one one week like lecture yeah, one week each week. Sorry. Excellent question. I'll get to that in a minute because that's actually something I want to ask you as well. So excellent question. Just one more minute because this one requires a little bit more discussion than just yes or no. So course mark, nothing unusual here. So there will be three exams. Uh, there will be participation, but it's not so much participation in the lecture as it is now. After each lecture, there is a little quiz, a little sort of, you know, um, not really a test. In each lecture, you will see there are a few questions. And as long as you answer those questions for me, you get the participation points that tells me that you've been sort of, you know, at least gave some thought to those questions and probably watched the lecture. And so they will not be graded as far as, you know, uh, 10, 9, 8. It's simply, if you do it, you get the grade. If you don't do it, you don't get the grade, unless you, you write something that is completely irrelevant to the questions, but you know, otherwise it's, that's it. And then the X culture project, which, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Exams, uh, you will have three exams. Uh, all of them will be multiple choice questions. So we will have Geeks Culture and their weekly uh, take home basically participation credits. That's where you can go as creative as you want, full answers, you know, sentences, pages. But uh, for the exams themselves, they will be multiple choice. There will be, I believe it's 40 questions per exam and you will have 75 minutes, uh, sorry, 90 minutes. Uh, for you guys, I give 90 minutes and you'll have 90 minutes to do the exam, but you will have a window of about four days to take the exam. So the window will always be from Thursday to Sunday. And so if you prefer to take it during the business week, you can. If you prefer to wait until the weekend, you can. So once you start, you will not be allowed to stop. So you basically, once you start, you have 90 minutes to finish. But when you take it, you can take it any time uh, during that window. So um, if you wanna you know, wait until the last minute, that's fine if you wanna. The X Culture Project will have a separate lecture Excuse on it. Excuse me, uh, yes, just like another question. Mm -hmm. uh, on which platform will the exam be uploaded to? Again, it, you only it on like on our school online? Like, uh, excellent question. No? And that's something, again, I want to ask you guys in a minute. It's a very, very okay. important question. I'll talk about that separately in a minute. Very, very good question. Um, the X Culture Project, briefly, what that is, is, um, and again, we'll have a whole dedicated live lecture you know, on this topic. But uh, one of the components of this course will be um, uh, an international collaboration slash consulting project. 
So I launched it 11 years ago. And so every year, like this semester, we have about 6,000 students from 187 universities in 76 countries. As of now, we may add one or two more before, before the project starts. And so we take all of those thousands of students from all around the world and we place them in international teams, usually about seven students, six students per team, each one from a different country. So each one of you will be on a different team and you will be, uh, like for example, Margarita will be with a student from let's say India, China, Japan, uh, the United States, Brazil, and Lithuania. And so uh, the purpose of the project is sort of twofold. One, uh, international collaboration. So here, uh, the goal is for you to experience uh, the challenges and learn the best practices of working with people from other cultures. So you will be completing the project with people from different cultures, different time zones, different institutional, political, economic environments. And so the things that I'm telling you or will be telling you in the class, you will experience in real life. Like if let's say we are talking about, let's say international management, and I'm telling you that people, for example, in China or the United States or Ukraine, um, you know, have different values and, you know, have different work styles, have different, I don't know, communication styles. You will not have to take me, you know, my word for, for, for what it is. You will experience that in real life. You will be working with people from those different countries. Second, um, uh, we have 10, well, sort of 35, but uh, so we have 10 companies and then we have Alibaba, the marketplace that came with their own 16 companies. So I think it makes it 26 companies, 25 total, but there will be a range or there is a range of companies uh, that present real life challenges and ask for your help with solving those challenges. And again, you will see those challenges, but in most of the cases, these are some big companies, some smaller companies, and some are very small companies. And so they ask for your help with, in most cases, expanding into new markets. So your job will be to do some research for those companies to, you know, look at the competition, uh, look at the, you know, uh, strengths and weaknesses of your clients and then develop a market entry strategy for a new country. So you'll think which of the countries would be the best new market for this, uh, for this product and then develop a marketing strategy for that country, develop a uh, maybe HR policy for that country. So things like that. So you basically will be a business consultant to a real client. You'll have a live meeting with the client, you know, with the, with the CEO or founder of the company. And so this way you will gain international experience, but also international business consulting experience. At the end, everybody gets a certificate. Let me see if I have a copy here. So um, I have only a copy of a very old certificate. So that's not from 10 years ago. Um, these ones contained, um, um, they contained um, at that time, uh, let me see if it can be. Uh, logos of all the universities. And now obviously we have so many that they just don't fit on the, on the page. So now it's, a, now it's a slightly different design, but you will also get um, uh, recommendation letters. Uh, so we used to be getting like hundreds and hundreds of requests for recommendation letters. So now you will get one by default. Uh, you don't even have to, have to ask for one. And so we have so many, like literally hundreds of uh, examples when those recommendation letters allowed people to get jobs, to get into graduate schools, uh, the story usually goes like uh, this, you know, I, I applied for a job, I came for a job interview, there were like 25 other candidates waiting for, for the interview, I had no hope, I come into the room, start talking about my background, the interviewer is falling asleep, but then I say, and by the way, I completed this project with people from all around the world, and my client was this company, and we developed a strategy for, I don't know, from Japan, for, for Japan for this company. And the interviewer wakes up like, oh, you, you work with people from different countries? And you, okay, tell me more. And before I knew, I got the job. And so that's exactly our intent. So we have many, many success stories like that. And so here you'll gain the experience and we'll make sure that you have a documented proof so that you can show it to future employers or future, I don't know, maybe investors uh, or whatever you will be doing here. And so we'll talk more about that separately. Participation, again, not really required as far as coming to the live lectures. I, I recommend that you come to them, but if you miss, not a big deal. But after each lecture, you will have a set of green questions, as I call them, and they are literally green, like I put them in green. And so uh, as long as you submit the answers to those questions by the end of the week, you will get your participation points. These are the questions that you will see in the actual lectures. So when you're watching the lecture, those will be the questions that I will ask as we move along and, and I will answer them. And so as long as you answer those questions, uh, I know that you probably uh, 
paid attention during the lecture and so for that reason you will be able to um, uh, you will be able to uh, you know sort of prove to me that you've done there you know that you participated and as long as you submit it uh, you, you got the full grade now back to the question about video lectures and everything else as always and I don't know why that happens every single year I have problems with Moodle so my login has now been restored and I can log in, log in, in the system but for some reason I still cannot upload the materials to Moodle and so I'm sure they will solve that at some point but I'm thinking maybe we don't even need it and so here is what I propose to do and you tell me now if you don't think it's a good idea uh, and if not I'll, I'll still try to make it work with Moodle but technically we don't really need Moodle so technically everything that you need for the course can be in this one document so as you can see at this time I already posted all of the lectures like for the whole semester you just click on the link and it opens the stream and you can watch it on YouTube right here if you want or you can go and download it and this way you will have the mp4 file on your computer or phone and you can watch it whenever you want you can download the audio version so this one has two parts so you can download part one part two uh, slides you just click here you got the slides you don't really need to go to Moodle it's everything directly linked you just click here and you can download from here or you can watch online from Dropbox uh, homework assignment same thing you just click on the link and you do your homework so you select your name and I think I now updated the list that should be everybody should be on the list but if somebody enrolls late you can just type in your name and yes my so my apology on the first homework assignment I think I forced response here and so there were a few students who um, were at it late and were not on the list but you got that figured out but yes so basically you just click for the homework you just click on the link the only uh, excuse me can you uh, roll up that uh, list in there uh, oh, for the homework? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I didn't see my somebody's name. missing oh no I see my name is cool it's cool it's cool then yeah. uh, usually Thank we you. have a few students who are joining late and if that happens one I will try to update the list but two, what I will add here is I'll add an option. My name is not on the list. And then you just type in your name. And so that way that should work. So the only thing that is not on the list is the exam link. And so what I do with the exam is I will send you a personal email uh, like a week before the exam saying that this is your exam link. Uh, take it, you know, during the window. And then I will send a couple more emails with a reminder if you haven't done the exam. Uh, by the end of that window and so the reason I don't put the link here because for the exam everybody gets a different link and so that link sort of contains your name embedded in it and so this way it's easier for me so there is no problem I know basically who took the, the test and since it's kind of serious I don't want you just you know take the exam 10 times for your friends choosing each time a different name so each link is unique and you have your own link and so honestly I don't really see the reason for using Moodle I mean the grades I will email you all the grades every week so I always and not every week after each of the exams I'll send you a detailed review of your performance you'll have that everything that you need is linked here so uh, if Moodle is not working no big deal I think we can survive same thing for example for the live sessions like today's you know it says that we have a meeting on the 24th at this time and you have the link you just click on it takes you directly to the meeting so tell me if this would be acceptable to you tell me if you think we must use Moodle in which case I will keep torturing the IT department and hopefully they will find a way to make it work but to be honest I don't even see a huge need I mean as long as you have this PDF file that that's that's it you have the links to everything including even the readings for some of the things here so um tell me if you think that's enough but um you know or maybe send me an email so again if you believe that we must have Moodle uh send me an email and I'll try to do that but otherwise I think we should be fine just as is um so I don't know any comments on this I mean would that be acceptable for you uh because yeah, that is fine so maybe like, let's plan on that as I said if they solve the Moodle problem in the next day or two I can migrate everything there but I just figured you know first for Moodle you need to log in each time takes a little bit extra time second I don't really see advantage of you know like you, you have everything that you need here anyway so yeah. maybe we'll stick with this format for now but uh, as I said if, if they either solve the Moodle problem or if for some reason this doesn't work uh, we can then convert but otherwise it should be fine 
And that's pretty much all I wanted to say. So you see the whole section, the whole, the whole uh, schedule, everything here. Oh, the first assignment. So a couple of students emailed me saying that they missed the first one. Technically, it was due by the end of the week. I mean, obviously, because we didn't have this meeting, obviously, I understand that some of you were not quite ready. Uh, that's fine. This one stays open. I'll keep it open until the end of the week. So uh, catch on on it for the participation for these green questions. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, I kind of recommend that you do it week by week so you don't wait until the last minute because the lectures are long and sometimes you have like these additional, you know, they're kind of fun videos, but I recommend that you watch them. Sometimes you have readings like here, like if you need to read something, you just click and it takes you directly to the paper and you read it. But um, it's just a lot of stuff. And uh, so it's nothing super difficult as far as understanding, but if you wait until the last day before the exam, it may be just too much to cover in one day. And so for that reason, I have these participation green questions that's kind of prompt you to do it on a regular basis. You can do it you know, weeks in advance if you wanna cover everything today, you have the links to the whole semester. But I kind of recommend that you go at a topic per week pace that gives you enough time to you know, digest and you know, um, comprehend the materials. And that's pretty much it. So for the green questions, I usually want, not usually, I will want to see them by the end of the week. Uh, for the exams, we have the specific window. Uh, so when, when it's an exam, let me see where the exam is. Um, yeah, so exam one, so it covers these chapters. It's non-cumulative. So once you're done with exam one, with those chapters, you don't have to do it for the second exam. It will be something different. The study guide, you click here, you will see the list of everything that you have on the exam. Plus we will have a separate, um, we will have a separate uh, live session to uh, talk about the exam. So kind of prepare, but yes, you will have 18, 19, 20, 21, four days uh, to complete the exam. And as I said, I'll send you a link, personal link uh, a few days before the exam. And then a few more reminders if you haven't taken it so that you don't forget. Uh, it's an online course. I know that you can sort of get swayed by other things. But yeah, that's pretty much all I had to say about the course. Now, if you have any questions, um, I have another meeting in a few minutes, but uh, we still have a few minutes. So please go ahead, ask your questions. When there are no questions, it can mean one of two things. It can mean that everything's clear, everything's understood, there is really nothing to ask, or it can mean nothing's clear. Like I have no idea what he's talking about. I'm completely confused. So I hope it's the first one, not the second. I have one regarding the exam, so uh, I do not have the PDF right in, in front of me. So uh, we are going to have an exam in approximately one month. Uh, so there will be three exams, yes. So there will be one, uh, so they cover about five weeks each. Plus there will be one week to prepare, you know, on the week of the exam, there is no lecture. So it will be approximately every six weeks or so. Okay, so another question would be whether it's enough to read the slides or to get like a 10 out of exams or... Is that a cat behind you? Yeah. <laughs> Research assistant. Yes, it will be more, uh, it will be, if you do the video lectures attentively, that's, that's enough. So there will be nothing on the exam that is not covered in the lectures. And uh, moreover, uh, everything that you need is also on the slides. And because it's an online test, uh, it's ob obviously open books, open notes. Uh, so I, I have no, I, you know, no way of enforcing you sort of, you know, to do it from memory. So I assume that you will have your notes with you. You will have the slides with you. You will have the textbook if you have it with you. And that's perfectly fine. So the exams are sort of designed and I have a limited time. So they, they're designed uh, to be taken sort of with all of the resources available. In theory, you can have your friend who, who attended the lectures there with you and he will tell you the answers or she will tell you the answers. And I kind of hope you will not do that. So that would be bad. And so there is no way for me to sort of to enforce it, but I figured since it's an online course and you're all at home, it will be very difficult for you to collude and do something, you know, uh, funky like that. But, uh, but yes, you can use any resources during the exam. And uh, in the past, normally people get about 75 on average you know, 75% correct on average, which is roughly what I would like to see. And so some people get all of the answers correctly, but some people don't. So, but yeah, we haven't had any problems with this format in the past, both with your, you know, with the new students, but also with my own students who also take this course online sometimes. So it shouldn't be a problem. And yes, uh, even if you don't study much, if you are really, really fast, if you go through the slides really fast, you can probably find the answers during the exam, but I'm just telling you, you will not have much time for that. So uh, you want to be prepared. It's okay to use the slides, but unless you are familiar with them, it will be, you know, it will take you more than you have time 
to find the answers. But if, you, if you've done the lectures, if you know what's in the slides and where things are, you probably will be able to verify each answer by just going to the you know, corresponding slide. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I also wanted to ask yeah, one, ahead, one more question about the readiness uh, test for X culture. Um, what kind of questions we need to expect? Uh, did you already get the welcome letter? Yes. Yeah, so in that welcome letter, you will uh, you have a link to the resource page. And so on that resource page, there is a PDF file uh, that basically covers everything that you need for the exam. It may not be a bad idea since the, the, the readiness test is not timed. You can literally just open the test and then read the question and then find the answer in that PDF file and then read the next question, find the answer. But there will be three components. Uh, one, uh, there will be questions about the project itself. So we want to make sure that you know, you know, where to find the deadlines, where to submit your work, how the teams are formed. So we want to make sure that you sort of know how the project works. Second component, uh, there will be some questions about um, um, sort of basics of uh, international collaboration. Uh, we want to make sure that you know uh, what Dropbox is, what Google Docs, um, you know, is. Uh, Zoom, things like that. So there is a little review of that in the PDF file. Most of you probably know those things, but just in case you don't, we want to make sure that people sort of have that. You, you don't have to use Zoom or you don't have to use Google Docs if you don't want to as a team, but we want you to know that they are available and what they do so that you know how to collaborate with people from different countries online. And then the third component is English. Uh, so there will be a quick kind of TOEFL-like test uh, again, it sounds like you will have no problems with it what, at all, but again, you don't want to have people on the team who are not fluent in English, and so we have the test just to make sure that people are adequately prepared. Usually about 95, 96% pass the test on the first try, and the system is designed to allow you to retake the test if you fail the first time. It will send you a new link one hour later, and you can take the test again. And so uh, on the second try, pretty much everybody passes, but there are always out of 6,000, we may have 60, 70, 80 people who will not pass the test. And so for those people we just say, you know, come next year, or maybe you should, you know, I don't know, get prepared and, you know, do again sometime later. And the reason for that again is nobody wants to have people on the team who are either incompetent uh, in the technical sort of, you know, area or are not fluent enough in the working language, or maybe who are lazy or don't care, you know, to take the test on time. And so there is a little sort of, you know, selection or, or readiness test specifically for that purpose. I do not expect that you will have any problems with it, but if any of you will fail on the first time, as long as you try, you should be able to pass it the second time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, well, very nice to meet you. Good to see at least some of your faces. And uh, yeah, so your next step is green questions for the last week if you haven't done them, then green questions for this week uh, you have until the end of the week. And then on the 24th, we'll have a dedicated uh, lecture or session um, related to exculture. And so, and then we'll have another one on the 27th if you missed the first one. I kind of recommend that you attend that one. So um, we will go over the details of the project uh, and you can literally take the test as we are in that lecture because we kind of will go question by question. So that will give you a little bit more information. And then uh, on March the 1st, the teams will be formed. So you have to um, take the test before uh, March 1st. And then on March 1st, end of the day, your end of the day, you will get the email, uh, an email with uh, the list of your team members. So you'll see like six names or something. And they will basically say, this is your team. Contact them by email first, and then it's up to you how you want to communicate. And then uh, you will have a week to just get to know each other. Then next week you will have to select your client company, uh, watch the webinars, uh, you know, meet the company representatives, but then select one client company. And then you just have the instructions and we'll go you know, week by week. So you'll select the best market for the country. You'll think about issues like, you know, pricing, marketing, you know, things like that. And uh, the exam will be, I think it's sometime in the middle of March. And, um, and that would be the first test, but we'll have a review session before the exam and we'll just go, you know, one week at a time. Um, right. Can I ask one more question? Yes, please. Um, so, do we have to do this X culture project or can we do something else? You don't want to do it? 
um, I don't know, in our entrepreneurship course, for example, last year, um, we had a choice not to do a project like this, but we could do something else. Let me put it this way. The satisfaction ratings for Xcultura are higher than for Samsung Galaxy, for iPhone. So students, about 95% of the students say that they loved it. It was the best project they've ever had. Another maybe 3% say, well, it was okay. And there are always like one or 2% who say, I hated it, my team was bad. And, but if you look at, at the ratings of like iconic products like iPhone 12 or whatever, the last one, there are always like 10% of the people who hated it. So uh, don't, don't, you probably will love it. If you are like most of the students, you probably will love it. If you based on the review and, and I don't know, based on that session that we will have before Xculture, if you think that there is no way I want to take it, I mean, I hate it already, I haven't done it yet, but I already hate it. Talk to me, maybe we'll think of something different for you. But I think you will actually like it. At least if you are like most of the students and we've had like 75,000 students who've taken it so far, you probably will not only like it, but it, it will actually help you in your future career. You'll probably use that recommendation later to get a better job. So, um, uh, don't be critical quite yet. I think you will find it much better than what it sounds. At the beginning, you didn't say that you were a salesman, man. <laughs> well, I'm not a salesman, but uh, here I have a documented, you know, empirical evidence. Uh, as I said, we do the satisfaction survey, obviously, at the end. We literally get hundreds of emails, sometimes years later, from students. Uh, we even had the first couple who got married. So he was an American, she's an Italian. Now they actually live in Pakistan. So we had a symposium in 2018 in Italy, in Macerata. So twice a year, we bring the best students for a face-to-face -face meeting. And now because of pandemic, we had to cancel one. We had, to, uh, we had one scheduled in Singapore last year. And obviously we had to cancel it. But then next year, if everything goes fine, it will be in Washington, DC. But so we even have some team members falling in love, getting married. So that's not what I advocate, but you know, that happened. We had a few students who started a company together and came to the symposium in Canada in 2019 to talk about their company and success. So we invited them just to share with the students. So uh, a lot of interesting things happens in, in Xculture beyond just getting a good grade. So you will be exposed to all kinds of new companies, all kinds of new friends. Uh, so it will, it will be a good experience. So, and as I said, we do have numerical proof based on the surveys that we do that students generally like it very much. Anyway, I'm late for my next meeting. Thank you so much, guys. Um, talk to you in a few weeks, um, and then hopefully you will like this course. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.